everyone. Well, we might as well go ahead and start. This microphone is troublesome, so just uh, be patient with it. On our introduction several weeks ago, I, I made mention, and, and I don't know, I said it, I might have said it so quickly that it, uh, it was lost to you. But I made mention that in re recent decades, especially after the Holocaust, any moral vision or comprehensive sanctity of life ethic that Christians have been working on have been worked on very closely in interfaith dialogue and interfaith conversation. We saw the great need, especially after World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust especially, to meet in various conversations and various faith communities to talk about the sanctity of life. And the reason why that is is because we've seen such a desecration of sanctity of life, of the sacredness of life, uh, as a result of the Holocaust, which not only affected uh, millions of Jews, but also people on the margins, people of color, and uh, people with disabilities that really didn't just happen overnight, but was a, a program of Nazi nationalism uh, steeped in Christian theology uh, since the 1920s. Uh, if you look back at the Nazi manifesto of 1920, you see the rise of nationalism couched in Christian language in which uh, Nazis, uh, and Hitler specifically later, tried to develop a theology in which certain races were considered impure and certain races were considered pure. Uh, they did work in the Bible and theology in order to push an agenda that basically robbed certain people groups of an idea of the sanctity of life. Let me just give you one quote from Hitler's speech in 1923, uh, and this will chill your bones. The Jews are undoubtedly a race, but not human. They cannot be human in the sense of being an image of God, the eternal. The Jews are the image of the devil. This was 1923. And as um, Hitler came into power and this, this nationalism rose, steeped in this Christian uh, Nazi theology, they continued to push uh, blood purification and eugenics and various procedures. In fact, uh, as of 1937, if you were a person of African descent, you were required to get an abortion if you were pregnant. Programs of sterilization were also important. One of the earliest groups that, um, that Hitler's administration went after were actually homosexual communities, LGBTQ communities. In 1931, were the, one of the earliest groups in which uh, there was a target of not only sterilization, but also um, uh, a rhetoric that excluded some people from rightly reflecting the, the image of God. Uh, ethicist David Gushy, my ethics professor, wrote this. The rapid acceleration of language relating to human life's sacredness, especially after World War II, is a crisis-induced recovery of an older moral tradition rooted in biblical faith, but never previously formulated as a matter of dogma. And he goes on to say, it was only when that norm of the image of, of sanctity of life, only when that norm was massively violated as a result of the Holocaust, and perhaps uh, it was only when that norm was massively violated, and perhaps when it seemed clear that merely secular formulations of that norm had proven insufficient, that it became necessary to articulate afresh and even to raise it to the level of official Christian doctrine. And what David Gushy is getting at here is that it wasn't enough to just have an unwritten norm, that because of the Holocaust and the massive violence of two world wars, people started to needed to talk about the sanctity of life and to reclaim what the Bible says about the image of God, not just within their theological circles, but within an interfaith conversation and dialogue. One of my professors at Palm Beach Atlantic University, Dr. Daniel Goodman, believed very much in interfaith dialogue. Uh, he was my New Testament professor, and he was very involved in uh, dialogue with uh, synagogues within West Palm Beach. And my first exposure to interfaith dialogue was uh, kind of riding his coattails as a student, uh, going to inter Christian Jewish dialogues within West Palm Beach and within that community. When I moved to Mercer in Georgia, uh, several of my professors wrote about various Christian responses to the Holocaust. My theology professor wrote a dissertation on Eli Wiesel, 
and several other uh, people who pushed against uh, anti-Semitic um, uh, movements. Uh, and if you know Eli Wiesel, he wrote Night. Um, David Gushy, who became my ethics professor later on, did his dissertation about Christians who responded in, um, in opposition to the Nazi regime. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who led the Reformed, what it's called the, um, not the Reformed Church, but the, um, help me out here, Mike, the Confessing Church. The Confessing Church that basically had to go underground because of, of Nazi persecution. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was put into a political, um, or he was, became a political prisoner, put into a concentration camp, and was eventually executed. And so I had a lot of exposure to the importance when we talk about Christian ethics, specifically related to the sanctity of life, of speaking uh, and bridging faith communities in conversation uh, because of the massive, egregious violation of not only pushing an agenda that denied people a place to bear God's image, but the violation and violence towards um, people steeped within Christian theology. Hitler just didn't tell people to kill Jews. He organized and assigned professors and pastors to, to write theology that literally instigated and created an edifice of mass genocide against not only Jews, but again, people who are disabled, uh, people of African descent, people of color, and other uh, marginalized communities to the point where it became important. So when we talk about doing sanctity of life, um, it's important for us to talk and to continue to build bridges of interfaith conversation. So uh, I've asked Rabbi Michael to speak here today. Um, Michael and I became friends very early on. When I first moved to Vero Beach, I, because interfaith uh, conversation and friendships are very important to me personally, uh, I, I don't know if he reached out to me or I reached out to him, but we connected. And we uh, got very involved in the interfaith community here and uh, quickly become friends. Uh, I spoke last month. Uh, Rabbi Michael was on sabbatical. Um, and uh, he asked me to speak at synagogue service one Friday night, and that was really fun. So I hope they enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, that was such a good relationship because not a, not a, few, weeks, uh, not a few weeks later, I, I had to do a funeral in which um, part of the... Uh, the funeral was for uh, the elderly gentleman that Jimmy Sizelove cares for. You remember uh, Jimmy Sizelove was a caregiver of an elderly gentleman. That gentleman passed away. Well, part of the family connection is, is Paul Berg from Berg and Vassell. And Paul and his wife Joanne is, are members of, of Temple Beth Shalom. So we're constantly crossing paths. And I thought it's very important for us to understand uh, how... We hear our Jewish brothers and sisters talk about what it means for people to be created in the image of God because we read the Bible through the lens of Torah. We read it uh, in our tradition, not, not the Hebrew. We read it in our tradition from left to right. Rather than reading our theology back into the Bible, we read the, we read the Bible through the lens of Torah, through Exodus, Leviticus, all the way into Jesus' ministry because Jesus connects to Torah. His ministry connects to Torah. To the Hebrew Bible. And so we read it that way. And so by having these conversations, we're able to find places of connection, places of differentiation, and are able to talk and to build together a more, when I keep saying this word, a more comprehensive sanctity of life ethic of gaining a moral vision in which all people are created in God's image, not just the people we like or the people we agree with. And that's incredibly important. Because it is God who ascribes the sanctity of life, not we who pick and choose. So, Rabbi, thank you for coming. Come on up and... I'm a rabbi, by the way, I'm Rabbi Michael Bernholtz. Um, and as Pastor Joe gives that introduction, he was mentioning this funeral. You have to realize that they, I, got, I, I had gone out to lunch with Pastor Joe um, and got back to my office and got a phone, this phone call from my congregants who were worried. We're not sure what to expect. A, path, a, 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 a minister is running the funeral service. Can you help us? Can you help us? Well, they didn't say that yet. They didn't say that, so I called them, and they're like, yes. Do you know this guy? is Pastor Joe LaGuardia. And I'm like, yes. He, I just had lunch with him. You're fine. 
and they're saying, well, he's going to call us a two. I said, yes, I'm guessing he can only call you a two because he was having lunch with me. <laughs> that very much reassured them. Part of me also wants to start in Revelations. Now, I, the reason I want to start in Revelations is because when Pastor Joe was at Temple Beth Shalom in, in, um, in, Ju in June, he declared to my congregation that he never wanted to speak about the book of Numbers. And what did I have him speak about? The book of Numbers. So I feel like I should start in Revelation because, no, I'm kidding. I'm not actually going to start in Revelation. Um, if you would like to see what Pastor Joe sounds like in front of a synagogue community, you can go to our Temple Beth Shalom of Vero Beach YouTube channel, and his sermon is up on the YouTube channel. Please feel free to like, to comment. Um, he, it was lovely, and my congregants very much appreciate it. And so this is wonderful that I get to come and have this opportunity to come and speak before you. How many of you eat with chopsticks? Raise your hand if you don't think you can eat with chopsticks. Awesome. That's a great illustration then. Because what I'm about to do is offer you Torah and Bible from a Jewish perspective. The way I teach it, the way I work with this text, it's the same Bible that you work with. It's your Old Testament, is our Hebrew Bible. I'm working in Genesis chapter 1, but I'm going to approach it in the way of my tradition and my community. And so it might feel a little bit like trying to eat with chopsticks for you. Some of the texts I have are very technical, but I didn't want to not present them to you because I think there's a lot in the language to see. And do not worry. If you have questions, ask questions. I tease Joe and the Treasure Coast Interfaith community all the time. I get paid by the word. <laughs> um, I don't really, but it's fun to, to say and to suggest. Are you ready? I hope so. So, um, as, I, don't, I think you can leave it up. Can you all turn, turn the lights back on? Let's see if you can see it, because then I can see you. Can you all read that? Not the top, but the bottom. <laughs> okay, can you see that? Okay, this is just, this is the end of um, Genesis chapter 1. This is actually from verse 26. Um, and I wanted you to see the Hebrew. I wanted you to see what we see and how we read it, because as we're talking about, about being Jewish and using this text, the Hebrew is central and the Hebrew is vital. Now I'm going to make this even easier for you. Um, do I have someone that can, and each one of these is, is the same page. I have 25 copies, and that has everything on it, and I also left an English opening for you. I did not do it from right to left, but I wanted to show you, I do have a mini little Torah scroll. Hmm? That's okay. I have a little mini Torah scroll right here. This is what we use for ritual, but it has the same, it has the five books of Moses in it, in Hebrew from right to left. This is not an actual scroll, it's a photocopy of, of, of the Torah scroll, but it is with the Hebrew, and this it looks like this, it feels like this. We read from this in our worship service. That is one way of us connecting with the divine, is doing an offering of words. We also do an offering of study. So this is called a chumash. Chumash is the Hebrew word for chamesh, which means five, and why would it be called five? Five books of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, and we read from the beginning of Genesis all the way straight through to Deuteronomy over the course of a year. There is a portion or parsha each week, and that is part, that's what we read from our Torah scroll. That happens on Saturday mornings, typically. We're reading our section of the week. Um, and that becomes our lexicon, our way of approaching this. This also has in it um, the Haftarot sections from prophets. And those sections from prophets are in all sorts of different orders and all sorts of little sections of it that connect back to the Torah portion. I do have a Hebrew Bible, a Tanakh, Torah, Prophets, and Writings. 
but that's not what we typically study from because the other thing that's in here is commentary. We have a rich, rich, rich tradition of commentary of things called midrashim, which are sermons, stories, it's fan fiction, um, saying with the rabbis and the sages starting in the 3rd and 4th century all the way up, saying, wait a second, how do I deal with these stories of Adam and Eve, of Cain and Abel, of Noah, of Abraham and Sarah, of Jacob and um, Leah and Rachel? How do I take these stories and what are they trying to teach me? What do I do if there's, a, if there's an ellipsis, if there's something in the story that I don't quite understand? What are the values that are coming through? And it's this really incredibly rich, beautiful, lots of layers uh, to say we're, we're the people of the book. We have so many different books, right? This is one chumash that I have. When I'm preparing Torah study, I, grab, I have four or five of these that I'm looking at because each one has different commentaries in it. The Hebrew is all the same, but the commentaries are a lot of different human beings each one approaching it from different ways and different places. I'm gonna, you're going to meet Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzhak, from 10th century France. You're going to read Moses Maimonides from 13th century Egypt. You'll meet um, the Ramban, Moses ben Nachman, Nachmanides. He is from the 12th, 12th century? 12th century in, um, ended up writing in, in um, the land of Israel. You're going to meet different, these different sages from different eras, from different places, and of course they're wrestling with different things because their world is different from place to place. Okay? So I wanted you to see that there is that this is the Kumash, and you can see there's a, the Hebrew text, there is commentary, there's even Rashi, Rabbi Shalom ben Yitzhak, who I was talking about, in his own font. Dude gets his own font. Um, and you'll also see that I... I, I don't know if you have Bibles that look like that, your study Bibles that it's all marked up with stickies. Um, thank you, God, for making post-it notes. <laughs> Makes it a little easier, doesn't it? Um, what, you're, what you have on the PowerPoint is the same as the page. The pages are numbered. They are numbered correctly, and they do go in English order. So we're already ahead. Of, for me, it's already ahead of the game. Um, so, and by the way, if you'll notice, one of my favorite moments of interfaith dialogue. I'm, this looks like the back of the book to you, doesn't it? Right? That's the front of the book. We were at Holy Cross. We did a, a um, dialogue with Holy Cross for a number of years, and we did. We brought. I brought some of our religious texts, and they brought some of theirs. And I was looking at a, at a Catholic lectionary, a Catholic book that they use for reading um, biblical pieces on during their mass. And I picked it up, and I'm like, wait, it's backwards because it was left to right. And I'm like, wait, it's not our book. Um, I'm so wired that for me, when I pick up a prayer book or a chumash, it's right to left. It's, it, um, the English is left to right, but the book is set up right to left. That For us, those are those texts. Okay, are you ready? So, we have Genesis. Genesis is, starts with Vayomer Adonai, El Moshe Lemur. Okay. I just did what I tell my Martin Bach Lisa students never to do. I just started reading out of my memory and not what was on the page. I know all of you were following along saying, Rabbi, that's not what's in the Hebrew. <laughs> but, okay. Vayomer, Elohim, God said, and this is Elohim, not Yudheva, okay? God said, Na'aset Adam B'tzal, B'tzal, B'tzal may knew, let us make human in our image, he demutenu, and in our likeness, yirdu, vidat <coughs> hayam, and we're going to set him down with the fish of the sea, the haof ha, uh, hashemayim, and the birds of the of the heavens, uvahema, uchol haaretz, uchol haaretz, haromes al haaretz, and all the people probably <coughs> that are in, that are on in the sky. Or excuse me, on the earth. Now I, I'm I am translating. I'm hoping you see the translation. I'm actually translating. This is language to me. Okay. Yivra Elohim, God created et haAdam. God created the human. But Salmo, but Elohim, 
In the image, in his image, in the image of God, Bara Oto, he created him, or it, Zahar Unekeva, male and female, Bara Otam, God made them. Okay? This is Genesis. I'm hoping it's familiar. This should sound a little familiar. Very familiar. Very familiar. Okay. So what we're playing with is the word B'Tselem, right here, B'Tselmo, B'Tselem Elohim. In the image, we also have this cool word up here, Kim Dumutenu, because you've got someone, Salmenu and Dimutenu, that you have in our image after our likeness. Okay? What's the difference between image and likeness? Is, there, is it the same thing? Raise your hand for yes, it's the same thing. We're just using synonyms. Raise your hand if it, no, those are two different words. Okay, so in Torah, no word is wasted. So if there's two words, they must be two different things. And that's where you get commentary. That's where you get midrash, different rabbis coming in different generations saying, what is the difference between those two terms? Now realize this, you might have heard two Jews, three opinions. Have you ever heard that before? Okay, I don't know if you have the same thing in the Baptist world. Okay. Um, and the rabbis do the same thing. Not every rabbi agrees with each other, and they tend to fight with each other across the generations. Rashi will say something in the 10th century. Rambam will come 200 years later and say, no, Rashi's got it all wrong. Here's why he's wrong, and we read both of them. And some days Rashi helps us more, and some days Rambam helps us more. So we're going to look at the, a little bit of commentary, if I can hold the, get the wheel together, looking at that idea of the likeness of image, we're going to see what some of them say. Okay, so here we have, as I said, um, Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzhak. I lost the, there we go. Okay, so Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzhak, and what we do is we take the first letter of each of those names and he becomes Rashi. Um, do I have any students of medieval French or 8th century medicine here? No? Okay, that's okay. So Rashi is living in Troyes, which is in France. I believe it's in the Alsace-Lorraine area. Um, and he is an um, amazing Jewish scholar. He's also a physician. There's a few of physicians in, that you're going to come across here. Um, and um, Rashi actually wrote medieval French treaties on medicine that are still used by medical students and people interested in medieval French to this day. Um, just kind of tells you what an incredible guy he is. He did have an interesting conundrum. Um, he only had daughters. And so eventually they marry off. He has grandsons. The grandsons do follow in his footsteps. But you get a lot of interesting gender issues surrounding um, Rashi because of his daughters. Um, so what he says about that, uh, that language of, in the image, in the type that was specially made for him, for everything else was created by creative fiat. So God just says, Wait a second, we're going to create, I'm going to create fish, fish are created. I'm going to create birds, birds are created. Only with humankind do you see this, we're going to make God in our image. Um, and the whole plural thing gets to be very interesting, but I'm not going to mess with that. I want to talk about what the whole idea of image is right now. Um, while he brought existence by a creative act, literally by hands, it says, thou has laid my hand upon me. So what you're seeing here is Rashi is saying, here's a text from Psalms. The Psalm says that God made human by hand. There's proof it wasn't just God thought, but there was some physical action that went into the creation of human being. Um, and I love this image. Human was made by a seal as a coin that is made by a die, which is called in Old French a coin. It is similarly said in Job, it changed as a clay under the, as clay under a seal. So there's some sense that there is a mold, a die made, and that humans are coming from that mold that is shaped um, by God, by the divine one. Okay? Um, here you're gonna get Brahma. So here is that idea of there's extra something going into the creation of humanity. Humans are different, Adam, um, you all know that word Adam? That's Adam, right? Yeah. But in Hebrew, it's a word, before it's a name, it's a word, Adam, which means human, 
It's also related to Adom, which is red. What did God use to make Adam? Clay. Red clay, Adom, Adam. God took clay from earth's four corners and gave it the breath of life. It's one of the songs I sing with our kids. Um, and um, here, that's, so when we're talking about Adam, there's something more going into that creation. There is Rashi. Rambam says, among all living creatures, man is uh, allowed to endow, endow like his creator with morality, reason, and free will. He can know and love God and can hold spiritual communion with him. Man alone can guide his actions through reason. It is in this sense that Torah describes man as being created in God's image and likeness. Okay? So, so Rashi is saying something more went into the creation of humanity. Rambam, is that Rambam? Yeah, that's Rambam. Rambam is saying that something is morality, reason, free will. And we're moving from Rambam to Ramban. So this is Moses ben Nachman, 12th century. So we're actually going back in time. Now, as I say, show you all of these commentaries, and I'm giving you a few that are in a pretty close band of a few hundred years. Um, one of the things that Pastor Joe said that caught my attention was getting to know Jesus and how Jesus understood his Judaism through talking to modern Jews today. And it's a little complicated because the commentaries I'm giving you are from a thousand years after Jesus. So the Judaism that Jesus knew, we don't know that we know what the, because we're now looking through past another thousand years of us wrestling with these texts trying to understand these texts, trying to live these texts and this culture and these rituals and all of this in all sorts of different places. And so we're, it's a little bit of both and. There is some of it that we are seeing the text that Jesus had, that it then was, in, it was followed the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, and some of it's more, much more complicated because we're looking back across so much history. So what did Rambam say? Rambam, excuse me. The meaning of selim, as is the word of toar or appearance, as in the selim, the appearance of his face changed. And he cites Daniel here. Okay? So what he's what Ramban is doing is saying, if I want to understand Demut and I want to say set and understand selim, if I want to understand these two words of image and likeness, he is looking for other places in the Bible where those words get used so we can understand them better. Okay? It's, it is a form of proof texting, and it's a wonderful, it's a rather incredible tool. Um, and then, so here's the quote from, again, from another one from Psalms. That is the appearance of their countenance. The meaning of the word demut is similar in similarity in form and deed as things akin to a certain matter is similar to each other. Thus, man is both low, similar to both the lower and higher beings in appearance and honor, as it is said, and you have crowned them with glory and honor. Meaning the goal of before him is wisdom, knowledge, skill, and deed. In real likeness, his body is compared to the earth, while his soul is similar to higher beings. So I, I'm going to parse that out for you because it took me a few times reading it, saying what is going on here. Ramban is saying that that um, that image that B'Tselem has to do with our physical form, the appearance. And demut has to do with our spiritual, the stuff you can't measure, our emotion, our thought, our reason, um, what were the words that were, our honor and our deed, that internal stuff, our soul, that's the image, that's the um, demut stuff, and the betselem, the image stuff, is the physical. And so what is he really saying? He's saying if God is saying we're making the human in our image, we're making it's both the body and the soul. One is tying us to the ground, and one, the emotion, the stuff you can't measure and see, that stuff is tying us to the heavens. And then what humans represent is that connection between the heaven and the earth, between the concrete and the infinite. And it's really a beautiful kind of image that if we're talking about being Betzalem Elohim, it's not just our soul, and it's not just our body. It's the two of them working in concert. It's all, it's all part of one thing, and that ties us both to heaven and earth. So 
We have a bit of heaven in us, and we have a bit of earth in us, and how do we bring that sense of heaven to, to the earth, and how do we find those holy sparks in our experience? Um, the last one is a, comment is a commentary. This is from a Chumash called Yitz Hayim. Um, in the ancient Near East, the ruling king was often described as in the image of, or the likeness of a god. So those words of image and likeness were used for the king to connect them to a god, okay? um, which served to elevate the monarch above ordinary mortals. So the pharaoh would say that they're in the image and likeness of Ra, the god of the sun, as a way of saying, I'm above all of the other uh, uh, the humans out there because I'm godlike. Okay? Um, in the Bible, this idea is democratized. Every human being, every human being is created in the image of God. Each bears the stamp of royalty. Going back again to that first text we looked, the first little piece we looked at. The, the, the seal that was used, the mold that was used, every human being is coming out of the same mold, out of the same seal. We're all coming from the same place. We're all made from the same stuff. And that is a huge part of B'Tzel and Elohim, of made in the image of God, is that we're all humans. We're all the same stuff. And to try to claim that one person is greater than another, it, it doesn't work because we're all the same. Okay? We have a basic set of humanity that we all ascribe to. Further, the symbols by which the gods are generally depicted in Assyrian royal stele are image Talamu of the great gods. Thus, the depiction of mortals is in the image of God makes humankind the symbol of God's presence on the earth. Not only will we stamp from the same seal, we're all made of the same stuff, but what was that seal generated by? By the divine presence so that each of us has that connection to the divine that is within us okay? um, so I'm gonna keep going because now I have as I read I think so I have three different thoughts that kept as I was thinking about those ideas of the ties of heaven and earth about that idea of that the word the seal is made of the divine but we're made of the stuff of earth that was both image and likeness. I was thinking about these and I kept wrestling with a few different pieces of Jewish wisdom. That if I'm saying, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? I started in that place that it's basically the shot, the simple part of it is that we all should be treated with dignity. But then something kind of interesting is looking at these different commentaries, a few different pieces. Um, how am I doing time wise? Uh, you're about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Um, and this comes back to your question about, the, the, about everything else in creation. There is a place in Genesis that says that man, that humanity will have dominion over all creation. There is another place that says that humans will, have, will be stewards of the land. And that is a constant tension that I really wrestle with because dominion means I'm superior on some level. I'm superior and therefore I get to control it. Stewardship means that I'm responsible for it, that I have to sustain it, that I have to care for it. And as I'm looking at all of these different pieces of saying how are we all made, what does it mean to be made in God's image? What does it mean that we're all, that everybody, and that beautiful commentary that the king used to say that the king was made in God's image, and yet what is the Torah, what it is Bible saying is all of us are made in God's image, it was part in going back to your question of, wait, what do we do with the other animals and the plants? And how do we, if we're saying that we are um, made in God's image, that we have this connection, does it give us the right to have dominion or the responsibility for stewardship? And that's, I, I'm, I will freely admit, I tend towards much more towards stewardship, but I'm also going to throw a few more things into the dominion. Um, the piece on dominion. So if you look at the bottom one, chosenness. Who are the chosen people? That's a loaded question. <laughs> ah, you, you're good on that one. The Jews are the chosen people, right? But what does it mean to be chosen? Hmm? The 
God revealed to the, to the Jews. But it doesn't answer, but the question is, does it mean that we got revealed more? Or different? What else? Choose one and not the other. You, you're making a choice over other people. More responsibility. Ah. If you're part of God's creation, you may be responsible. And so that is exactly where I, what I was thinking. Not as Jews as the... See, if I had a pomegranate pucker, I'd be, I'd be giving you a pomegranate pucker. you got to ask Joe about those. Oh, I owe you pomegranate puckers, don't I? Okay. Um... That's exactly what I was thinking about. Because it would be, and that goes back to stewardship and dominion. It would be really easy for us as human beings to say, oh, God made us special. We are made cast in the image of God. We have the likeness of God. We're, we've got heaven and earth on our side. It would be really easy to say, see, we're the chosen ones, and therefore we control everything. We're the best. And yet, as I was reading all of these texts, as I was thinking about if I've been, um, I'm going to quote Spider-Man here, the first one, the, um, the Tobey Maguire, Sam Raimi films, if any of you are fans of them, what did Uncle Ben teach Peter Parker? With great power comes great responsibility. So as I look at dominion and stewardship, yeah, I might have to be, I might have a lot of power, but really it's, if I'm given something of, if I'm, cre if I'm a descendant of Adam, if I am part of this humanity, if I am made B'Tselem Elohim, instead of saying that gives me power to have dominion over the world and control and superiority, to me it becomes all about responsibility. That here, if I've been given all of this opportunity and power and privilege, what do I do with it? And that's where I keep, even, even as I think about that word dominion, Dominion doesn't actually mean I get to run everything. It means if I've got that much control over something, I have that much more responsibility that goes with it. That brings me to that middle one. Beautiful saying from Talmud um, that you're supposed to carry a piece of paper in your pants, in your pants pocket. Um, and in one side it says, I am but dust and ash. And on the other says that the whole universe was created for my sake. And so sometimes when you're down in the dark, in the dumps, you might need to look at the whole world was created for my sake. And other times when you're feeling on top of the world and you've got everything under control, you might need that bump of humility of saying, I am but dust and ash. I look at these as they talk about the element of moods, as they talk about in the image and in the likeness, that it's really a balancing of those two ideas of feeling that earth and feeling the responsibility of the earth but also realizing there is something more and how am I responsible and connected and bound to that something more. If every time we look at another human being, we are playing with those ideas, we are, and not playing with, we are using those applications, those challenges to us, not just in, some of it is I'm looking at other human beings and saying how are they made in the image of God, but I also take it as responsible. When I'm moving through the world and interacting with other people, what does it mean that I'm made in the image of God? Because how I'm made in the image of God is going to impact how I treat the other people around me. It's about my, I can't control the folks out there, but I can move in a particular way, acknowledging how I am shaped in God's image and likeness, both my physical body that has amazing resiliency um, and all of the, the fact that like a collection of uh, like billions of brain cells is shooting chemical reactions that have little sparks of electricity that's allowing me to talk to you all, that's pretty amazing. That is pretty incredible. That's that spark of heaven and earth. Okay? So that's what, I, as I'm reading this and looking at all of those different pieces, that's where what I'm really wrestling with. I'm managing to push all kinds of buttons here. Apologies. Um, and I want to look at two texts with, with you. Um, these are both from Sabbath, parts of our Sabbath prayer book. Um, the one on the left um, is uh, from a conservative uh, prayer book we use. In the beginning, God created the transcendent, infinite, without end, the heavens, that actually are not. Right? You can't, you don't boundary the heavens. 
They are infinite, they're eternal, you can't, you can't measure the heavens, right? But the earth, the imminent, what's close by the finite and the boundary, that wants to be touched. Infinite and imminent, transcendent and in, imminent touching. In the beginning, God created threads stretching between them. Between the heavens that are not and the earth that cries out for help, God created humans made from the clay of the earth. We have the stuff of the heavens, the infinite, and we also have the stuff of the finite and the clay within us. For each person is a prayer and a thread touching what is has no end, what is transcendent and infinite with a tender and delicate touch. That image, that language of being made in the image of God is part of me being a thread to connect those two places. Um, Again, talking about that responsibility, that sense of collaboration, that sense of community. Um, we, you have made us a little less than divine. I'm um, sorry, that was my reminder to put this text in. When we behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars that you set in place, what are we humans that you are mindful of us, we mortals that you take note of us? You made us a little less than divine and adorned us with glory and majesty. You gave us dominion over your handiwork, laying the world at our feet. How majestic is your name throughout the earth. We even say in our Sabbath worship, we get all of those things. Wait, I'm but dust and ash. I'm mortal. I am finite. As I get older, my birthday's next week, um, and I've been here for 20, I've been in Bureau for 20 years. Um, I was really young when I got here. I was older than a Martha Spa kid. I was 13, although they wondered for a while. Um, and my kids that were born here have now gone off to college. Let me tell you, I'm feeling the whole middle age thing. Um, <laughs> what are you that reminds me of us that you take? And yet, you've also made us a little less, just less than divine. You've adorned us with glory and majesty. We have incredible abilities and opportunities as we move through the world, even as we're finite, even as we're fragile. Um, and then the last one um, is whoever, well, our tradition says that God created us through a single human being, one human being, to teach us that whoever destroys a single human soul has destroyed an entire world, and whoever sustains a single human soul has sustained an entire world. A single human was created for the sake of peace, that man might say my lineage is greater than yours. So, um, it is interesting, I am curious, when you have Victor here, is he talking about made in the image of God? No, we're doing sin and salvation. We're giving him a real church. Oh, you're giving him sin and salvation. Oh, I could have fun with that on the high holy day. I'll tell you what he's um, so, um, but it's, it is amazing to me when we are doing interfaith programs and somebody is there from the um, Islamic community, and they say to us, say, they will very often quote that from the Quran. That's part of interfaith dialogue and using these texts. You might read these, this Bible, these texts in a different way. We're all reading the same book, and there is something to happen from the dialogue. There are things that I quote that I have that are part of my text, and there are also in the Quran, as quoted by Muhammad, we all have, we, there are so much, we, there are plenty of differences, but there's a lot of stuff we share, and how do we use both it, again, it's that heaven and earth. How do you balance those things? How do we balance our similarities and our differences? How do we let those relate our relationships, even if we don't, there are stuff we agree on and don't agree, to be able to strengthen ourselves each in our own way that we move through the world? Um, I say it often. What do we all have? We all have a fingerprint. And yet every human being's fingerprint is different. It's, it, it is just, that is part of B'Tselem and Elohim, and what I also love is every time you touch, what happened, um, if you looked at your phone screen right now, what would you see on your phone screen? You'd see your fingerprints. I don't think we even realize how much we leave our fingerprints, our little touches of heaven, um, behind. Hmm? Not to talk too far, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, clap for a wrap on my time. Uh, so...